Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to one new episode of Mega Chats. My name is Felipe. Uh, as always, I'm your host here, uh, leading you guys through these quick, casual conversations on our printers, 3D printing in general, best practices, how to do stuff with the printers, how to get the most out of the printers. Uh, and happily so, we're now starting, well, this is our 10th episode, right? Um, as you guys may have known, last week, the, the two weeks back, we had a couple of uh, summits, both for professionals and for EDU, hosted by MakerBot. We invited a bunch of different people over, basically, to talk about 3D printers. We had student astronauts, we had NASCAR races, we had like actual students from different high schools coming in and talking about how they have used uh, MakerBot printers themselves, what's their experience, what do they do with them, uh, and some of their tips. Uh, it was pretty good. I would highly recommend, if you guys haven't or didn't watch them, to go over to our um, website and then on the resources section you can find all of the, uh, well the streams, basically not the live streams, but the, the conversations that we streamed last week. One of the guys was actually like one of the designers, the costume designers for Black Panther, the movie. He's worked with Stratasys and, uh, you know, Stratasys being the make of a partner, uh, partner company. Uh, yeah, he talked about a lot of crazy applications, but I won't spoil it for you guys. You should definitely go watch it uh, if you haven't. But without further ado, I'll get started with today's episode, which is um, a little bit of a follow-up of last, um, well, two weeks ago which was just a sketch overview, right? A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the MakerBot sketch, how big is it, how do you use it, what are the properties, what are the main difference or the key differences between the sketch and the method, uh, which are kind of like our flagship printers right now. Method for professional, sketch more geared for EDU. However, you know, uh, <laughs> having the sketch right here with me, I wouldn't dismiss it entirely as like, a say basic printer, it's actually rather, rather capable, right? Really useful, a lot of fun to use, straightforward, and ultimately it gets the job done in a different way than method. I would say that Sketch is perfect for quick prototypes, like to test um, different ideas out, and method is more geared towards uh, material uh, differences, right? You really want to be choosing, say, if you're using ABS or now carbon fiber, which we just introduced um, a couple of weeks back. But with Sketch, you have two material options. You have PLA and you have uh, the tough material. And that's pretty much more than enough for what you will be able to do with this printer, right? So last week, we talked a little bit on uh, the build volume, right, the size of it. I've heard a lot about, um, you know, people wondering like, okay, how big can I print with a printer? It feels a little bit too small or maybe it comes across as way smaller than what method is. And to be honest, so this is a cube, uh, 14 by 14 by 14 uh, centimeter cube. That's about, what is it, uh, close to six inches cubed, right? Um, and, you know, it's about the maximum build volume of the sketch. It's pretty reasonable, right? And then the point or, or of today's episode is to talk about what happens when you try to go beyond that build volume and what can you actually do beyond just printing like a large cube in the printer, right? And today's example is a really exciting one for me because I've been playing with it quite a bit. I actually designed this first, uh, this claw, for the Replicator Plus a couple of uh, months ago. And it's a very simple assembly, right? It's, uh, sorry about the sound. And by the way, we have a new camera, which is amazing. Hopefully, it will be getting way better details of the, of the parts. I'm really excited about it. Hopefully, it will work. Uh, it will work, because last time, for some reason, it was like flickering around. But in any ways, um, assemblies and sketch. So I'm going to be talking about this specific assembly, uh, which is you know, you can see it's sort of a robotic claw meant to be used like a, it's basically a linear actuator. I'll, I'll stop talking for a second because as, as I um, move it around, it, yeah, the sound is just too loud. But I'll show you how it moves first. Just making sure that you guys got that. Uh, but you can see like it's a, it's a straightforward element, uh, you know, Linear actuator pushes these elements out like so, and that makes the claw open. And as the linear actuator retracts, it brings the claw or the fingers back in, and you know closes on whatever it is that you're trying to pull up. So let's say something like there we go. You know, just like trying to get an object and putting it back down. This is just like the first pass at it. I wish that we uh, that I had the time to 
develop the electronics behind it, like just you know putting uh, some Raspberry Pi and the actual actuator to make it move uh, like with a controller or something. But for now, just talking about the specific assembly and what it took for me to make this, right? Uh, starting by the fact that, as you can see, you know, this claw is way bigger than the actual build volume of the uh, sketch, right? It goes beyond the build volume. And the reason why I'm able to do that is because this claw is, you know, as you can see with the colors and the highlights and whatnot, the claw is split into multiple segments. And I'm going to talk about the different segments in a second. So I'll bring just real quick, here we go, uh, the different parts. So let's talk first about the different parts that make up this um, concept, right? Uh, first, we have the fingers right here. So these blue tips, I call them fingers because they are quite literally the element that will grasp and hold to what you're trying to, to catch. In this case, just this uh, dodicahedron, right? Then the second element are these green beams, which I called the phalanges, right? Basically, I, I'm just naming them after my hand. So you have the fingers, you have the phalanges, which are these three elements as FYI. Uh, the industrial designer, you get to take anatomy classes uh, back in college, but anyways. So the phalanges, which are the element that will join the finger towards the center core or the core element here. So here you can see how these phalanges come, all three of them come and nest right in the center element, this little bolt here that is going to be receiving them. Um, third element, sorry, actually one, two, three, fourth element is going to be these, um, the actual, the actuator, right? So joint that I'm pushing up and down uh, to, to actually make the part move. And the final element, well, second to final, I guess, but the final element is going to be this, what I call the trident, right? The trident, which is the main component of the assembly, it's going to be what ends up hosting the whole thing. Uh, and then, of course, I also printed the actual bolts of the assembly. So these orange parts or orange bits are just printed bolts. The way that I did that, let me disassemble this for a second so I can push them out. Here we go. Uh, so I printed, uh, let's see if the camera, yeah, it's picking it up. It's actually doing a great job at keeping the focus tight. Um, so the bolt itself is both the bolt and the nut. Both are 3D printed. And you can see like the tolerances are enough for me to actually play with how much uh, give do I want to make, to have in the assembly. In this case, if I want like a smooth fit, you know, the offset right here is about, not about, but it's actually 200 microns between the different circles. So the circles here in both the finger and the phalange are about, are about uh, three millimeters. This guy, the bolt itself, is, has an offset of 200 microns, so 0 0.2 millimeters. And then the nut itself, which is going to wrap and enclose this thing. Let's see if I can get it right in the camera. Uh, here we go, yeah. There we go, right? Uh, so the nut itself, which is going to actually keep everything tight, and I have, I think, one, two, three, yeah, so nine of them. Uh, it's the thing that puts everything together and you know uh, completes the assembly. So all of the uh, the whole assembly is 3D printed, right? In different parts, different components, different colors. You can get a little bit more creative when you're printing an assembly because you're not simply locked down by the one material or the one uh, color, right? Uh, some assemblies actually do benefit from that material mix. So let's say if I had a part that needed to be uh, a little bit stronger or that need to, that we'll be seeing a little bit more wear and tear, I could print it with uh, our tough filament, which by the way is now certified by uh, Green Guard to be office, classroom, and now well, here in my living room, right, a uh, house safe. Uh, that's just a great thing to keep in mind and to give you some more peace of mind of how, do you, how safe these printers are nowadays, especially like for somebody who's thinking about uh, summer activities for the kids as they are now not at school, but like, having some time at home. Um, just something that's great to keep around and to have around the kids. But, uh, so that, those are the main elements of the assembly. Now, how do you print this assembly, right? The actual uh, elements. I am going to show you first my tubule plates right here, right? So those are the tubule plates that make up my assembly. As you can see in my final model, the one that I'm holding, um, this has more than two build plates. The reason for that is, was that this element was my first pass at uh, printing it, right? I was sort of iterating as I went. So I printed only some of the components together. In this case, I printed the trident and I printed the, the core hub together. Then I printed the phalanges on a second set. Uh, and then I printed the fingers on a third set. And the final element that I printed was the main hub. However, 
once I was happy with the assembly, once I knew you know, that the tolerances were, were right, that the assembly was actually working the way that I expected to do it, I was able to simplify the printing process a little bit and have it you know, fit in two bill plates. The great thing about the MakerBot sketch is that it actually comes with three bill plates. I mean, not saying that you have to actually um, keep the parts in the bill plate until you're ready to make uh, or to put everything together, but it's definitely helpful to be able to just swap the build plate and print the second one. So I'll take the, uh, this guy. Um, I printed the blue one actually overnight uh, last night. Right? Uh, but these are all of the components. So you see them both, well, in the photo and I'm just holding them here, <laughs> just like the doubling down on the way to print the assembly, right? So in the build plate number one, I am printing the phalanges and I'm printing the fingers. I am printing also the, the screws and the bolts. And on the build plate number two, I am printing um, the hub, the main, the core, and the trident, right? And you can see how all of the parts are like, as long as you can nest them together, you're completely fine to fill up as most uh, or as much as you want of the of the build plate. And that's kind of the idea, right? With something that's so uh, robust, so trustworthy, like the sketch itself, it's great to have that peace of mind of saying like, hey, you know what, I just need to print whether that's a single assembly with multiple parts or I want to print many parts at once. And also, you know, ultimately it comes down to being able to expand a little bit what might come across as a, um, sort of the basic components of the, of the printer, meaning the minimum or maximum build volume. And how do you go beyond that, right? How do you, again, expand uh, that build volume and ultimately expand the capabilities of the printer, right? So as, as, you, as you can see right here, the build plate is super easy to remove um, here in uh, on Sketch. It has a different system than with Method. So with Method, you have magnets that attach the build plate to, to, the, to the build surface. In Sketch, you actually have a spring-loaded build plate, right? So you can, I don't know, let's see. Oh, let me go back to the video, just a second. Here we go. All right, sorry. So here you can see like uh, the build plate. I'll just take it back out because I just realized that you guys weren't uh, seeing that. But the build plate itself, uh, it's made out of this polymer and has the grip surface with all of the labels in it um, and a little clip here that help, uh, helps keeping it in place. The way to attach it is just pushing it down, pushing this element down, right? This is actually the heated build plate element. So this will get hot, this gets, I. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it's 100 degrees C, or a little bit more than that. Um, unlike the method, as we said before, this is not a heated chamber printer. It's just a heated build plate. So it's only going to heat the first couple of layers here. But that's great just to make sure that the parts are uh, correctly adhered to the build plate um, and ultimately to get successful prints, right? So to put that build plate back in, pushing it down, sliding it in, and that's it. It's as easy as that, right? Right now, both my build plates are done, so I'm not starting a new print, but you can see how easy it is to just swap them in and out, and instead of waiting, you know, let's say that I wanted to post-process the parts or I wanted to get start, uh, I, I'm going to take some time before I remove the parts from the build plate. The good thing about the sketch is that it comes with three build plates per printer, so you know that how it comes with two printers uh, in a single kit. Uh, it also, each printer has three build plates, right? So you can use them either just as replacements, or you can use them to expedite the process of uh, swapping uh, build plates in and out. Especially like if you, if you think about having a larger project, or if you having uh, if you think about having multiple students uh, submit projects at once, it's great to just have that ability to swap in and out um, the build plates. Now, talking about a little bit, let me fade back here on how to create those assemblies, right? So that's another thing that we get asked a lot, and I'm going to show my original Rhino files. So I need to check one thing though, because I am not sure. Let's see if it's actually working. Yeah, so I'll have to apologize because for some reason the window is not refreshing uh, on my assembly, but you can see how basically what I did in Rhino there. Uh, so this is my Rhino file, right? This is um, my, my layout. And you can see how I have those little um, curves defining what my build plate area is going to be like. So since I already knew that I wanted to put as many parts on the build plate as possible, what I did once I had all of the different components was I just drew in Rhino and this is, you know, I'm using Rhino, but you guys might be using Fusion 360 or Tinkercad or uh, 
I don't know which other um, open source software you might be using, but anyways, it doesn't really matter. The point here is that you can just define that area, in this case, uh, sketch, sketches maximum build volume, which is going to be uh, 149 millimeters square, right? You just draw that square, and in that square, you start placing your elements in, right? So what I did right there, and you can see like those two squares on, you know, both the lower left corner and the lower right corner, you see those two squares that host or that have all of the little pieces assembled there. So I just take all of my parts, right? I assemble them, well, I distribute them on the build, on the sort of, um, how to call it, the phantom build plate or the pre-build plate. And then once I, once I've done that, I just export all of the parts and as a single file, as a single SEL, right? So I'm going to go ahead and select all of the parts. And again, I'm sorry, I don't, I'm not sure why it's not. I believe it's just my computer is running out of space. I should probably clean up my hard drive more often. Um, but I just select all of the elements on that build plate and then export them as a single SDL. That's really important. And I'll show you why in a second. So once I've exported them, and I'm going to move you guys now to make a good print, right? Once I export them, I can just take that single SDL, and in this case, I've got um, already one of the build plates uh, preloaded, but you can see how if I add a new build plate in Maker Web Print, uh, sorry, add a model, select Claw Build Plate number two, right? And it's just going to import all of them as a single element. Now, you can either do that, or if you were to pick like individual elements, sorry, individual elements from your assembly. You can also do it in Maker with Print. Uh, so and let me just uh, show you what I mean. So for example, I bring in, I can bring in the Trident, uh, the core element here, right? And I'm going to orient it, place a face on the build plate. In this case, that bottom piece. This, this, this uh, tool I like a lot, right? It allows you to select one of the faces of your part and define it as the bottom, the top, or whatever it is. So in the same here, I'm just putting it as button and the part is right there. I'm bringing another part. Uh, let's say I want to bring the finger here, just a second finger. Uh, it inserted it in a second different build plate. I can just move it to build plate number three. There we go. The parts are intersecting right now. So I can just move them around right here. You, s you can see how, so these, these um, this box is actually red because I am out of bounds with the fingers of the, or with this finger, of the maximum available um, build volume for Sketch, right? And that's just because of the way that the software plays the finger in it. So I can just, I, can, I have two options. I can either scale that part, or since I know that the actual largest dimension on that square is going to be that diagonal between the two corners, I can simply orient that part, select that finger, say 45 degrees, you know, I was showing that you could either have uh, already the build plate pre-exported as multiple components, so a single STL that has multiple bodies inside, or you could just create a new build plate and start importing. Uh, I'm going to bring, in this case, I'm going to bring the finger right here, and I'm also going to bring um, Let's do the phalange now, because I don't. I really don't want the computer to crash again. I don't know why that happened, right? Uh, but in any case, so I was showing how can you actually get uh, a better uh, or more bang for your build plate, I suppose. Uh, in this case, the finger is going beyond or out of bounds of the build plate. That's why you see that red highlight happening on the on the cube. Uh, so what I was doing, and I'm, I really hope that the computer doesn't crash this time but I'll just do it once more, spinning that element right here, putting it there. You can see, okay, uh, another interesting thing to point out here, uh, I'm sorry, like with these new setups, I need to work on it because I have the, the camera here and the computer's over here, so just bear with me for a second. Um, so the phalange here, you can see how it's actually sideways. I could print it like that. The, the issue that I'll have is, and I'm sure that many of you guys can already uh, see this um, it's going to be that that element you see that secondary element right here I'm trying to get inside so you guys can see it right so this phalange thing this element this printed element right here right um, is ha has two little ears 
that actually are the elements that attach to the finger, right? So you see it here in the video. Um, I'll go back to the video for a second. Here we go, fade into the video, right? So the phalange here, right, is going to have those two little ears that are actually what come in a pair or as a pair and capture the finger end. So if I was to print, I'm moving back to make a print. If I was to print this part like so, then I would need supports right there, right? Because that second ear is going to be just floating in me there and it's not going to be able to be printed without supports. So the way to go around it again, Super important to consider part orientation when you're preparing your model to be printed. It's just select that part. Again, talking about that really useful tool. I like it a lot, it simplifies my life. Um, selecting one of the, of the faces and defining a, that face as, in this case, the button, right? It's just going to, you saw that happening, it's just going to auto orient that element there and put it against the build plane. Now, another cool thing that, that to consider here in my code print is the fact that you can now that the parts are there, you don't necessarily need to re-import that part to make your print, but you can just duplicate them right there. So you can just Command C, Command B, uh, so copy, quite literally copy and paste it, and the software is going to try to auto uh, place them uh, in the build plate, right? So it's really useful in that it's uh, actually super smart, and it's just trying to optimize the part. If you don't like the way that it was placed, you can always move those parts around, you can make them tighter, you can put them closer. It's just really important to consider that, of course, these parts need not to, or have to not be overlapping uh, against each other. But yeah, so those are the two ways that you can actually go ahead and create your build plate. In this case, you can see I'm going to go, come back in here to my um, webcam, right? So this build plate I created in Rhino. You can also do it in uh, MakerBot Print. I just was more comfortable exporting the STL already with all of the components sort of pre-arranged. You can do that, as I said, either on the modeling software that you might be using, Fusion, Rhino, SolidWorks, um, Tinkercad, and export all of the bodies as a single STL. So you select all of them and click export STL, and that's how you use it. Or you can import the individual uh, bodies, so the individual STS, STL, so the finger one, finger two, finger three, uh, phalange one, two, and three, and the bolts and nuts, um, and just bring them into your um, to your MakerBot print, right? Uh, and it all comes down to how reliable the printer is, right? So sometimes with like uh, entry level printers, what you will have is issues when you're trying to print a without a raft. So as you can see, all of these parts were printed without a raft. The raft is going to be a second element here that basically creates quite literally a raft of plastic upon which the parts are going to be nested in. In this case, I didn't use a raft because I, I wanted to be able to remove, to easily remove the parts from the build plate, right? Um, and don't, and I didn't want to spend so much time post-processing the parts, right? And you can see how uh, firmly attached to the build plate these parts are. It's just like really flat. Even the smaller components, it's like really, very any strings happening right there and even if even as the part is sorry as the printer is jumping back and forth between all of these different locations it's still going to be doing uh, an awesome amazing job like look at the the wall here uh, in the finger right uh, yeah. um, maybe it's easier to show it in this part but like the the how clean the sketch actually prints for me just really impressive I think that it has to do a lot with I don't think, I believe it has to do with the gantry and the way that this printer is set up. So this might not have a super sturdy um, frame that the method does, but it still has a very interesting assembly and componentry that allows it to not wiggle that much. As we've touched uh, you know, this subject in the past with many printers, they will flex a little bit as the uh, print head is moving around. Since here you have two elements moving at the same time, so the build plate is moving back and forth, and the nozzle is moving uh, on the, say, the Y direction and also the Z direction, right? Uh, that actually allows the printer to be so much more stable and stability traduces into better, you know, print quality, uh, nicer walls, the actual result is like so smooth, it's really hard to see the layer lines here. I mean, you sort of can see that, that shaded element, but it's like, even if I bring this really close in, it's just going to be, um, hard for you to notice it. So 
amazing way to get more out of, the, out of the sketch. Oh, and by the way, all of these files I'm going to give away for anybody who wants them. Just send me a note at uh, felipe at makerbot.com or hello at makerbot.com and just say, hey, can I get the claw files? And we'll send them over to you. I'm also going to put them in uh, Thingiverse shortly. But I really want to see like who's interested and also like in the comments in YouTube if you want to just uh, ask for that file. And again, it's the full assembly with third fingers and then hopefully somebody will remix it and make a real like linear actuator with it. Uh, but with that, I'm going to go ahead and jump into the questions. So I have the questions over here on the phone. Uh, here we go. How does my printer's tolerances and materials shrinkage come to play with the parts I print for my assembly? Well, that's an important thing to consider, right? And that was, as I was saying before, why I would start by printing the different components like on their own, just like say testing the assembly between one finger and one flange. So then just to make sure that the actual, say the rod fits, the offset is correct. The rule of thumb for most 3D printers is to use like a 200 uh, micron offset for loose tolerances. So something like these bolts, 200 uh, uh, microns are going to be more than enough for it to be smooth. And then for something that you want to be tighter like this, like this element right here, going down to 100 or 50 microns, it's going to be enough so that the part doesn't slide as easily. Like I have here another um, assembly and you can see how, how easily this, this hub slides. So this is about 200 microns, the offset, uh, and it just gives you a way looser assembly. It all depends on how loose or tight you want the assembly to be. Um, is it possible to design and print an assembly with articulating surface all in one print job? Yeah, that's exactly what we covered, right? Uh, if you want to print everything articulating like that, it is possible, but then you really have to be careful on how you orient the parts. I don't like it so much because it's like, it's more like a, it's, it's kind of, it's interesting, but it can compromise your, your printed element. Do I have to save an assembly file as one STL? Yes, that's what we covered. Um, how to choose appropriate fit, clearance, transition. So I think that that's also part of what I was saying. Like uh, 200 to 500, 200 microns to half a millimeter, that's great for loose fits. Uh, 100 to 200 microns is great for um, tight fits, something like this. And press fits and something that really needs to be, say, once you put it in, it needs to stay put. I would say 50 microns, but those type of tolerances are better suited for a higher end machine like the method. With the sketch, you can definitely try to do that, but uh, it's going to uh, take some fine tuning, I think, uh, depending on the on, on, on your part. On, oh, sorry, on your part. Um, tips for designing interlocking parts. Mm. I think that the most important thing to keep in mind is that it's ultimately a uh, trial and error, right? Uh, so you print elements because you're not only, like for instance, let me show you guys two things here as an example. Uh, you're not only going to be testing um, the printer's capability, but also your idea. This was my initial hub. You can see how I just had these very simple rings to receive the fingers um, and the, in, the, oh, sorry, in, the, in the center of the part. As I realized that this was a little bit too feeble and that you know it might need a little bit more beef to it, then I just expanded that element, made it a little bit beefier right here. And you can see like, when you put them side by side, the learning process happening, which is basically, it kind of sounds a little bit obvious, right? It's just, well, the beefier the part is, the sturdier, sturdier it'll get. But still just realizing that, hey, you know what? If you give it a little bit more um, plastic, a little bit more material to actually hold in place, the part is just going to be that much more stronger. Uh, moving forward. And I had some of these fail and that's why I realized like, you know what, I, I need to make this part a little bit beefier. Uh, but yeah, that's the importance of prototyping, testing and having the printer available with you guys. Uh, is the sketch printer sold as a single unit? Can you just please to sketch this printer so and share? <laughs> I know, I know. Um, so the sketch printer is sold as two printers at once for $1,800. Uh, I would say talk to your neighbor, talk to a friend, get them both and just, you know, you send, you send that over to their house. It's an amazing machine. It's especially like for indoors and for right now that we are all spending quite a few hours, if not the whole day uh, stuck inside. It's amazing to have around you. It is sold as a two pack, but that actually means that it's, you're getting two for the price of one, right? Um, I would just say, try to say, if, if you're buying it for yourself, um, 
team up with a friend, ask a neighbor, whoever, a uh, relative, uh, you know, uh, somebody who's also interested in 3D printing, and then you can split the package because uh, it's definitely a printer that's worthwhile for the indoor setting, for you know, summer, um, summer workshops and whatnot while enjoying your, your time inside. And I think with that, we're going to be covering most of what we have, the content we have. Uh, do send, you know, your questions. Uh, sorry, here we go. Do send your questions uh, our way. If you have any feedback, any comments, uh, put it on the video down below. Uh, also reach out to me, Felipe, F-E-L-I-P-E -E, at MakerBot.com or hello at MakerBot.com if you want to learn more or if you have more specific questions about Sketch, if you want that file, again, I'm just saying, uh, I'm going to give away that file to every, everybody who actually sends me a note. Uh, so I don't, it doesn't really matter when you actually see this video and it's going to be probably also on the description later on, uh, the link to the file. Uh, but yeah, if you want uh, that file, just send me a note. Again, doesn't matter. Hello at MakerBot, Felipe at MakerBot. I want the claw file and we'll send you the whole assembly. Well, not the whole assembly, but like the individual parts, right? So you guys can actually print it on your own and let us know um, the successes that you've had with the file itself. So with that, I thank you again for another uh, chat. Let me know if you have any questions or any comments. They're always welcome. And we'll see you next time. So thank you and see you next week.